Hi, this is Pat Moorhead with More Insights and Strategy, and we are here for another episode of the 6-5 Podcast, episode 97, the sometimes Friday morning, try to commit now Saturday morning because it's my fault. But before I get into my pity party, I want to introduce my amazing co-host and bestie, Daniel Newman. How are you, my friend? Buddy, I love seeing that big smile in the background. Uh, nice imagery. We're both um, off location today. Um, you know, I've been doing it in my studio. I'm backward. Many of you probably have seen me for some time now because this is what my setup looked like for a long time. But uh, you're at home. I'm at home. It's Saturday morning. Um, you know, you had a really rough week. <laughs> it uh, throw, Your week got, let's just say, thrown off, Pat. Um, so I'm glad we've been able to be here today. No, I know. Um, this is the third time that Pat has screwed up the Friday morning podcast, but, uh, no, this is a pretty good one. So, uh, uh, as we've talked on the show, my wife, Paula is an avid horsewoman. She owns, uh, owns a horse company. She pulls horses in from Europe and makes them, uh, American hunter jumper friendly, and she rides horses a lot and she rides competitively. Well, uh, on Wednesday, she was thrown on a horse, did a cartwheel and broke her hip. So I have been spending the last uh, two days uh, trying to take care of her uh, and get her back. We're hoping that uh, she'll be able to come back uh, today. Sorry, yeah, actually today. And Daniel, she was walking three hours after she had nearly a two foot titanium rod inserted into her femur and three screws uh, put in there to, to get everything uh, in place. And, you know, I was super happy, super appreciative of the doctors at uh, St. David's Round Rock. They did a great job, little plug, they deserve it. Um, but also kind of the miracle of, of medicine, you know, you know, Daniel, we, we like to criticize our healthcare system. Uh, I, I, I realized that I uh, was on the board of uh, directors of St. David's. Uh, I was actually chair for three and got a, got a front row seat. Uh, but I got to say, at times like these, I appreciate the American uh, medical system where you can immediately get in. There's no waiting list. And uh, my wife is up and walking uh, in three hours. So, so let me just say, first of all, I'm so happy that everything is going well. Uh, you know, she's so tough and that's such a, you know, hard thing to have happen. And obviously she'll probably be off the horse for a bit, but hopefully a very, very quick recovery. Um, you know, these are the things, man. We work a life that uh, we want to be on top of this show. We want to be out every Friday. We want to talk about all the most interesting things and of course provide that next level of analysis for you, our audience. But you know, this is the world we live in, Pat. Life is not always uh, symmetrical and every Friday is a great goal. But hey, just the fact that we're starting to travel again, you and I getting back on the road, our show may not be every Friday at the same time, but what we can promise you is we will do our darndest to get this out every week like we are right now on a Saturday morning, up early, chugging coffee, and ready to talk about a pretty interesting week in tech. That's right, let's dive in. And, you know, aside from, you know, if, but, but first I have to say, if you're wondering if I put our videos on just so I can look at myself and, and Daniel, I, I do. Um, <laughs> I just keep it up there, just, just no. Normally, Actually, it's playing, you know. I, I needed something to, to interesting to put on the background, but you know, let's dive in. We have some great topics. I mean, I'm so excited about uh, the topics we have. So we have uh, Elon and Tesla moving their headquarters from Palo Alto to Austin, Texas. Woohoo! Uh, some discussion on Qualcomm Automotive. Uh, there were Marvell and IBM investor days with uh, some disclosures, but also just setting, you know, what, what can we expect from these companies uh, for the next year? Uh, we had a pretty exciting uh, Micron Future, the data center event, and they launched a brand new line of SSDs. And this last one's going to be fun. Intel dispelling the Apple spell. 
So, Daniel, let's dive in. Well, 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 well. Yeah. we can't quite dive in because we didn't do our disclaimer. So, oh, okay, okay. So, so first off, yeah, we're going to be talking publicly traded companies, uh, but don't take it as investment advice. Seek out professionals because this is all about education and, and entertainment. I always like to say do the opposite of anything we might infer. Uh, Daniel likes to back off of that just a teeny tiny bit. Also, if this is your first time uh, on the 6-5 podcast, uh, we cover six topics, five minutes each, sometimes nine minutes each. We go a little over and long, uh, but uh, we like to focus on more of the meaning of it as opposed to the news itself, because you can pretty much find the news anywhere. We might sneak in some news to get a little context, but we really want to talk about the meaning of it. So Daniel, let's dive in, if that's okay. Tesla moves to not just Texas, but Austin. And little story here. So if you remember during COVID, uh, there were some challenges uh, that Tesla had restarting one of its California factories. Uh, assembly woman Lorena Gonzalez said, F Elon Musk, he responded with message received. <laughs> and then uh, he ended up a few months later personally moving to Texas. I think he's living in one of those mini homes uh, next to his uh, one of his rocket launchers, or at least that's the the lore uh, that's coming out. But his company hadn't decided to move. But this week at an investor conference, he said, we are moving our headquarters from Palo Alto to Austin. So, Daniel, I think what what we should have a, a robust conversation on is is um, is is this the giant tech sucking sound? from California to Austin. Uh, is this a temporary thing? You know, it's more like a red versus blue uh, or, or, or are there some real reasons? I, I'd like to start out j just with, with some comparisons. And also I've talked to a lot of people who have made the decision to move, including uh, Oracle, uh, HPE, multiple VCs, and the most important of them, Futurum Research <laughs> and Daniel Newman moved from chi town to austin by the way you know if you're not from chicago you call it chi town but by the way we, this could be a full-on six five special we might have to come back for this one because i just want to throw out a few i just want to throw out a few things though so there's a lot this is a very complex topic because it, and it all depends on the variables of of, of that are important to you um uh there's a uh, chief executive, chief, chief executive .net, and they do a survey of hundreds and thousands of CEOs. And they pick, pick the best and the worst states for business. They pick Texas as number one. Uh, they pick California as number, number 50. Okay, so that's only, you know, that's one rating. Oh, by the way, it's, it's, it's by uh, CEOs. CNBC puts California more in the middle. Uh, and they they put in a lot of um, social justice issues uh, and 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 things like that, where where California scores uh, better better than Texas. But it's typically mostly about two things. It's about taxes and access to to to, to labor. And in there is the whole regulation thing. So you know, let's do a little bit of comparison. I mean. Um, California's tax, uh, tax rate alone goes up to 13.3%, um, and, uh, Texas is zero, uh, California capital gains, by the way, I lived in California, so, uh, I, I can, I can tell you even leaving California was tough as I was getting harassed, uh, by their tax board three years after I moved from California to Texas just to make sure that I actually left and that I wasn't actually doing any work uh, in, uh, in, in, in California. Uh, capital gains taxes uh, are taxed as ordinary income as opposed to long-term capital gains on, on federal. That's uh, another, another thing. California's corporate ordinary, sorry, corporate income tax is 8.8%. My Texas franchise tax is 0.75%. Uh, percent, and the list goes on and on. Uh, you've heard of nightmare stories of people, even in you know 
cities like San Francisco, where it takes them a year to get permits to change the facade or the overhang uh, that they want for uh, for uh, their restaurants. So, uh, again, you're right. We could do this. We could sit here and talk about this the entire show. But um, uh, I and I also think it's very city based. So Austin has gotten uh, their housing has gotten 40 percent more expensive over the last year. Now, they're going to have to build that up. Uh, which which I know they will because we actually have land and we encourage uh, buildings. But then again, we don't exactly have a huge public transportation to get you know people to their work. That's why in Austin, uh, we have these sub uh, downtowns that are forming that are closer to where uh, people work, like where Apple put their corporate headquarters on the uh, on the, uh, the the north side of town. But Daniel, is this a is this a blip? Is this, you know, is this a permanent thing? What do you think is going on? Well, I think we've definitely seen a migration that will be followed by some very significant companies, right? Last year, we saw Oracle come to Texas, huge company, 400,000 employees, the, the name sponsor of the San Francisco Giants ballpark. I mean, a company that's been as rooted in San Francisco and in, this, in the Bay Area as any company in tech. We saw HPE, uh, which always had a significant presence in Texas, in Houston, decide to, you know, uproot the corporate, you know, uh, headquarters and move it to Texas. Tesla had really, this isn't like, it was kind of brought up as another news cycle, but we sort of knew this was happening. I mean, after Elon received the message, he up and moved within like a month, uh, started building another, was it Gigafactory, a mega factory here. Yeah. Um, he bought a city to expand his space endeavors in Texas. And, you know, he's a pragmatic guy. He's an iconoclast. He's a got a bigger than life personality. But the thing about Musk is he's also he's a business savant and you know he sees the financial benefits the talent pool the more affordable housing and says this is a more realistic place to grow um you know a company like Amazon that does more hub and spoke Pat you and I went to San Marcos and saw one of their their major uh, locations and now Amazon hasn't moved their headquarters although I have started to see some 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 news popping up actually I just read one the other day about Amazon maybe leaving Seattle um, yeah. Could it be for Texas? And, and my point, though, is, is that, you know, cities, cities like San Marcos, though, you know, where you have people that need affordable housing, you have thousands and thousands of that's achievable here. And if you yeah. want to bring talent, it's hard. You know, when I was looking at moving, Pat, I wanted to move to a tech hub because that's what we do. And when you did the comparatives of Seattle, of San Jose, of Austin, Texas, Miami, by the way, picking up steam and momentum, oh, yeah. um, Raleigh, if you just kind of created the pros and cons for a business and a destination, Austin's kind of got it all. It's got, you know, it's got the city, it's got the sprawl, it's got uh, personality, it's got a great uh, corporate tax structure, it's got good personal tax structure, great university system here in Austin, Texas. Um, and on top of it, you know, other than the heat for maybe a month or two, the weather's nice for people, you know, year round, you can be outside, even if you're a little hot. So uh, I, Pat, I think this trend will continue. I think Austin's got more growth. It is getting expensive. So we're going to have to kind of keep an eye on that. And of course, here we have to keep moving. We've spent nine minutes now or a little more on this topic. But this this is a this is a great one, Pat. And it's you and I now calling Austin home. Elon, welcome to Austin. You, you know how to get a hold of us, Elon. <laughs> <laughs> Call me, baby. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Okay, let's jump into the uh, the next uh, update. Uh, Qualcomm Automotive is on the rise. Yeah, I flipped these, dude. I, you know, I'm, I know. I'm, I'm, I listen. I I was rolling with you, buddy. You want to do this one, or you want to do Marvell? You know what? Uh, let's go to Marvell, and then we'll come right back. You know what? I put these in order, and I switched it. And this is a Saturday morning fever. So. Um, Listen, I shared a tweet yesterday about Marvell, and I said, you and I watch a lot of investor days. Now, we're always very clear here. We talk about earnings and investor days, not through the lens of us competing with equities analysts or, uh, or you know, sell and buy side. We really try to inform that audience. We try to provide 
you know, technical depth, uh, strategic vision, and then we couple it with what we call the truth serum that comes out through, you know, SEC requirements because, you know, you can put architecture around anything and make a new launch exciting and tell a story and get everybody really pumped up, but the numbers don't lie. And so investor days are always interesting because it's kind of the confluence of those two things. It's, it tends to be a big dose of numbers and a big dose of product and, and innovation strategy. I, I tweeted this, Pat. I said, Marvell probably had one of the best investor days that I've ever seen in terms of, you know, one, I think the stock went up six bucks on the day of their investor day. And, I, and, and again, they were trading in the 50s and it went into the 60s. So this wasn't like a $400 stock that went to 406. This was a stock that made a 10% move as a result of its investor day. I paused for that sneeze, by the way. If you're not I mean, listening I mean, to this, Pat just sneezed and I actually paused as if that was gonna, that was gonna help. Um, for, the record, for, for, for the record, I did mute it. Uh, you did great, I just, I paused. Um, and so first and foremost, the market loved what Marvell had to say. Now you and I have been very bullish on Marvell. I've written articles on Market Watch. I've called them a semiconductor name. Uh, I still occasionally run into people when I say Marvell that think I'm talking about the comic book company, not the case at all. But, you know, I'm, I'm going to hit some of these updates really quickly here because, you know, Marvell is a company that kind of came out of what was a very difficult period, made a, uh, a great hire in Matt Murphy, CEO, a really smart acquisition with Cavium, changed its direction from consumer to enterprise, entered all the right secular areas, getting in data center, automotive, 5G. And then this investor day basically came out uh, uh, upping its outlook for revenue by a 5% swing from 10 to 15% now to 15 to 20%. Um, noted that its market opportunity because of the semiconductor boom has been so strong, has increased 50% now. They see their opportunity at $30 billion. Their uh, cloud business and their 5G and auto revenues are gonna grow at twice the speed of the market. Uh, they see it as 40% per year. They raise their outlook um, for big $100 million plus customers now to uh, now having 19. Now, it doesn't sound like a lot, but $1,900 million customers is a $1.9 billion run rate. And that's 100 is the base. So some of them are spending more than that. Yeah. And on top of that, in semiconductors, we always say, we're not trying to get every you know, Joe to buy the, their brand. They know who their customers are. They know who the, the people are that they're gonna try to sell to, whether it's data center, automotive. And then of course, um, their design win outlook doubled as all part, part of this announcement, Pat. So, I mean, what a, what a tremendous uh, financial, you know, pathway for investors to just say the potential of the stock. So they got some upgrades right away from those analysts that do set that. Now, of course, on the technology side, I'll kind of lean into this a bit and then I'm gonna pass it to you so I can leave you a little something to talk about here. But one, you know, the cloud optimized silicon was a huge part of their story. Um, their Innovium acquisition, um, all about the, creating this fabric and this connectivity layer to, you know, to be able to address this cloud market that they've identified. They're building on, t you know, we can have a little debate about the, the architecture here, but they're continuing to build on the most advanced process nodes from TSMC, um, moving from what TSMC calls a five nanometer, we'll just call it TSMC five to three. Um, and that's all part of their plan. And probably the last thing that I thought was really, really awesome on the tech side was they got their first big automotive win on, and, on, and I'm talking at the CPU system level. So they're jumping right in, Pat, and they're going toe to toe uh, for that full automotive system. And we'll talk more about that like with Qualcomm in a few minutes, but Marvell's not running from anyone. They're, they're working side by side, they're competing, they're winning big customers. And they're not afraid. And then, of course, they had a whole bunch about the company, the corporate sustainability, DEI, doing some really good stuff there, Pat. But God, have you seen an investor day that was more inspired than than Matt Murphy and his team at, at this, uh, you know, this this go around? I don't, I don't know if I have. Yeah, I. Everybody likes a comeback story. And uh, listen, I I've been interacting with Marvell since its existence, right? Uh, consumer hard drive uh, controller. Uh, play is what I knew them for. And uh, in the past five years under Matt Murphy's leadership, he has 4X this, okay? 300 
and 97% the past five years. And he started a little bit uh, before that. And that speaks for itself. And uh, like you said, we're not securities analysts, but uh, I personally like to tune in because it is the source of truth. Uh, it's a one-stop shop to get uh, everything about the company strategically to see if something has changed, uh, to see measurement against what they promised before. And yeah, they uh, they they absolutely brought it. I mean, the, the company's just, it's indistinguishable from itself five years ago. And a lot of that is to deduce uh, with some intelligent divestitures and some, but most importantly, some very important acquisitions. And if you've never been part of an acquisition or a divestiture, don't underestimate how hard it is uh, to disintegrate and integrate. And and so it's not just you know Matt and company buying a company and then taking its revenue and moving it. These companies are growing uh, after they they've been acquired. Whether it's a Quantia and uh, uh, the latest one, uh, Inovium, whether it's uh, sorry actually Infi, Cavium, Avera Semi. Uh, Q-Logic, uh, the list goes on and on where consumer now is this tiny shred of, of peace. And, and really when I look at it, the, the only companies in, in its competitive sphere right now are, are, are Intel. Now, sure, uh, there's a little bit of NVIDIA uh, in networking and, and some of the uh, AI work that they do, uh, potentially some AMD if the acquisition uh, goes through for for Xilinx, but they're very unique in that they are a the really the only one stop shop for what they do in this area. One other thing that that I really want people to keep their eye on though in the future, and, and this is where I'll end, is I, I love their take on heterogeneous compute and as the wave of the future, and they found a way to do this level of customization for their customers and inserting their own special IP, whether it be through uh, an ASIC uh, or, or something uh, like that. And, and that is the future. Multiple ways you can do that. We, said, uh, we see how Intel does it with 3D packaging. AMD has talked about a little bit of how, how they might do it uh, in the future, but that is the, that is the future. So. Uh, I'm really excited about them as a company. Um, yeah, they, yeah. They, they also, Pat, by the way, uh, you know, been kind of kicking Broadcom pretty hard. <laughs> so, oh, you know, oh, when you look at yeah. you look at where that growth is coming from, first and foremost. Um, but it's just it's been impressive across the board. Yeah, it's so funny. I always used to put put uh, Marvel and Broadcom together, but as Broadcom is shrinking in in a lot of these areas, and them not doing you know, some of the some of the same stuff that they do. And Broadcom is still a consumer wireless play. I don't even put the two of them together, but it is fun to talk about uh, for it sure. Is. Uh, so let's move to our next topic. And that is uh, overall Qualcomm. So uh, uh, interesting, I, I don't normally tune into General Motors investor days, but uh, I was pretty excited to see what they talk about the future of autonomous cars. Uh, their valuation, uh, Tesla is running laps around GM in terms of valuation, even though GM is the number five or four based on revenue or units on the planet, and Tesla is way, way down there. Now, why is that the case? Because investors see the future as autonomy and the future as EV, and more important, uh, I'll call it the, the infinitely customizable car, and that's something that, that, that people lose sight of. So. Um, they came out and introduced, GM introduced what's called Ultra Cruise, and this is a higher positioned uh, system than Cruise, which think of Cruise as L1 up to L2 plus, and think of um, Ultra Cruise as uh, three and, 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 and maybe four. It was hard to determine exactly how far it went into four, but these things are kind of amorphous, but the ability, uh, and I'll... Um, I'll, I'll, I'll quote GM on this, and, and this is part of the news that's important. Uh, true hands-free driving across 95% of driving scenarios. And GM says uh, Ultra Cruise will ultimately enable door-to-door -door hands-free driving on all public roads in the U.S. Now, they didn't say 
uh, no steering wheel. And they didn't say that the drivers weren't going to be uh, in there. So that leads me to believe three and four. But deep in their press release and their slide deck was this, we are using five, I'm going to use air quotes, nanometer technology. And the architecture is scalable. And I was like, okay, uh, two companies that I think have that now, uh, NVIDIA, well, at least the scalable part, uh, NVIDIA and Qualcomm. NVIDIA hasn't talked so much about the five nanometer, but there is a company, a chip company that you and I both know that has five nanometer uh, and a scalable platform called Qualcomm Ride. And I did an analysis uh, at CES 2020 that cataloged that Qualcomm and GM were aligning for ADAS. So was this Qualcomm, is this Qualcomm silicon? Uh, GM didn't, didn't say it. Qualcomm didn't say it, but I'm kind of following the breadcrumbs there. And if I look at Qualcomm, $10 billion automotive backlog, $1 billion annual run rate based on the most recent quarter, $250 million in revenue. I'm kind of thinking that this is Qualcomm. Yeah, I think you hit it on the head, Pat. This is not hard to back into. GM doesn't want to get its investors lost in who its technology partners are. So it instead focused on process, the capabilities, the technology. But of course, if you're a semiconductor company, um, <laughs> only Intel has ever been able to somehow convince every one of its OEMs to slap its brand all over its products, which credit to Intel for that. We'll talk more about them a little bit later. But uh, in terms of companies like Qualcomm, you know, I, I wrote a piece after IA Mobility in Germany, kind of talking about semiconductor companies becoming the linchpin of the future of automotive. Um, this is a great example where looking at the underpinnings of companies as large as GM, and of course, you're going to see the same thing with the Volkswagen groups, huge automotive groups, understanding wh whom, which tech companies they are acquiring their technology is going to give a pretty good insight into growth and the role that semiconductor players are making. Now, um, I'm going to pivot the Qualcomm discussion here on that note because Snapdragon Ride is, I'm almost certain, what's uh, what's going to drive the future of GM's autonomous driving platform. Um, and of course, Snapdragon Ride is an extensible platform that also uh, connects the rest of the stack. You know, when you think about things like infotainment, telematics, um, instrument cluster, it's about this expansive tool set that can be built on compute. Um, and that can can you know be scaled out. There are other architectures that are more closed for ADAS, and that's those are interesting as well. And every OEM is going to approach this differently, but that's the route Qualcomm is on. And speaking of Qualcomm, uh, just want to touch on the fact that you probably heard in automotive they were you know in this uh, battle to buy Veneer. Um, originally, Qualcomm had a deal to buy Arriver from Veneer, and then what happened is a big tier one. Um, Magna came in and, and made a tender for the whole company. And so all of a sudden, Qualcomm was going to lose out this prized asset. Arriver is a L2 plus ADAS system that was acquired by Veneer. And that was really what Qualcomm wanted. Um, they're looking for something that, you know, they're piecing together their ADAS through Snapdragon Ride as it stands. They want to expedite that with some good, good technology that was held by this Veneer organization. But with the Magna deal, uh, Qualcomm had to re uh, come back to the table, basically uh, aggressively in the night on a Sunday, made a tender over the uh, offer of Magna, got board support, um, and essentially moving forward. But everyone knew Qualcomm doesn't want to acquire the entire tier one, doesn't want to be a tier one. Qualcomm wanted that intellectual property innovation and some components of, of the Veneer, which was the Arriver platform. And so they came out this week, announced a deal, partnering with a company called SSW. And basically, just to kind of be clear, is now everyone knows the path. The path is going to be SSW is going to acquire the Veneers in its entirety. Qualcomm, for a small sum, small sum as compared to the whole deal, is going to acquire Arriver. SSW, this organization, it's not a private equity firm, but it's going to act as a, um, you know, as, as a partner in essentially identifying the most important assets of the Veneer organization and then finding homes for the rest of the company 
uh, that are ideally more strategic. Um, in the end, Pat, my assessment is this is Qualcomm making a move to stay focused on what it was set out to do, which is expand that ride platform, acquire this ADAS technology, and not get stuck in the middle of parting out a large tier one, uh, found a partner company to help header the deal. Of course, you know it's gonna get its looks from a regulatory standpoint, but it seems like it was really well organized, put together and orchestrated under you know new CEO, Cristiano Oman's leadership. And as I see it, um, they're going to get their 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 man arriver, and Qualcomm's moving forward. And this automotive space for them is going to be really significant. You said ten billion pipeline. You can tell the company's really focused on it. Great, great analysis. Uh, I'm glad you added on the VNR piece because it's all part of of the puzzle here. I put a, a lot of links uh, from Daniel and I in the in the show notes to. That, that goes over uh, all this. In fact, Daniel, I, I wrote an article that said, no, uh, Qualcomm isn't becoming an automotive tier one. Not the most uh, creative headlines uh, I put <laughs> out there on Forbes, but uh, I, I wanted to I wanted to make that point. Uh, let's get into the next topic here. IBM Investor Day. Pretty sure this was the first Investor Day uh, with Arvind leading uh, uh, the crowd. Daniel, uh, what, what happened? Uh, what's going on there? Man, we've hit the investor day window. In a couple of weeks, we're going to hit earnings palooza again. Pat, it's just oh, all this truth serum, so digestible. I know, um, I know. You're going to have a lot to talk about on your markets show. Oh, Making gosh. markets, uh, Daniel. Making markets. Yeah, if you haven't checked that out, I, I do have another show. It's uh, it's my second favorite, uh, other than you know my bestie show here on six five, but. Uh, I do get some of these CEOs to come on and talk to us just like we do here, but it's more more really diving on some of that earning stuff. All right, Pat, I only did that because you did that. I wouldn't have, wouldn't have done that. Yeah, um, Daniel, we, we got to, you know, every once in a while. Cross we promote. We gotta, By the way, uh, cross your, your, Forbes piece, your Forbes piece was tremendous, Pat. Do you want? Yeah. Should we just stop and take a look in the mirror really quickly and check our yeah, head? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hang, hang on a second. Hang on All a second. Right. Looking, look, looking good. Yeah, yeah looking, yeah, looking good. pretty good. All the people that are listening and don't have the video are not going to appreciate this segment. Um, <laughs> all right, so investor briefing 2021 came on a Monday morning. Um, so straight out the week, we were we were on it here. You know, there was a it was a long session. It was several hours, and so I want to focus in on some of my key takeaways from listening in on Arvin's section. Um, this is going to be the stuff that the masses of you will get the the most. If you are a big follower, every one of the business units had a chance to present and dive in. So we heard from, you know, we heard from systems and we heard from infrastructure and we heard from AI and quantum and everything else. We got some of that. But when it comes to what's going on, the big picture here is IBM is about to complete the spinoff of Kindrel. And so the reason I think this investor day really made a lot of sense was the world wanted to understand, you know, despite the fact that, you know, the Kindrel and the in the infrastructure management part of the business that's being spun off is not, um, you know, some of what I would say were the core focus areas for IBM. Um, the long and short is I think everyone's wondering what comes next, right? What is IBM going to focus on? What does this mean for the company? So this is really where I thought he was coming out to really provide some clarity. Um, Arvin spent a lot of time talking about optimizing the portfolio. Um, you know, he wants to get the offerings more clear, um, make sure that it's it's broken down. I'll talk about that a little bit more when he talk about how they segment and they're going to report their their um, earnings going forward. Platform. I mean, listen, every company on the planet right now is, is using and understands the value of the platform and being more platform centric. Um, you know, everything within uh, the IBM software portfolio has now been optimized to run on OpenShift. Um, you know, they're focused on cloud native, they're focused on microservices architecture powered by Kubernetes. So that was a big part of Arvin's presentation. I, I called it platform, platform, platform. Now you talk about original headers. That was original in my piece. Um, you know, the investing in consulting with, like I said, parts of the technology consulting going out with Kindrel, um, you know, Arvin's kind of headers are, were really about AI and hybrid cloud. Those were the two big areas that he really sees driving the company forward. So there's going to be significant resources invested by the company in making sure that their services and consulting groups are able to help companies overcome the challenges of being meaningful uh, hybrid deployment strategies, as well as getting the best out of analytics and AI. 
Um, and, you know, he was really clear that the money is in hybrid cloud. The company knows it. The company knows the public cloud is big. For IBM, public cloud growth has not been uh, on par with the AWSs, with the uh, Microsoft Azures, or even Oracles and Googles. Um, but they have been able to make the public cloud and their overall hybrid cloud strategy work by focusing on being a leader in enterprise hybrid cloud. They've got over 3,200 uh, you know, of their clients now leveraging their whole hybrid strategy. Um, the Red Hat acquisition was massive. It was a huge dollar figure. People kind of wondered, would it work? It, if the Red Hat hadn't, deal hadn't been done, I would be actually much more concerned about the prospects for IBM than I am today. Um, and, you know, I guess I want to just kind of make one or two mentions specifically about post Kindrel, what I'm looking for. Because I could talk about a lot of things. They're going to re they're going to change their reporting structure to break into three buckets, essentially going to be consulting software and infrastructure. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on that. I'm, I'm still a little bit confused how that all breaks down, but the software is going to be where the hybrid lives. Infrastructure is going to be where systems live and consulting is going to be where GBS lives. Pat, IBM has probably for the past, I don't know, what is it, 10 years now, kind of suffered from a sideways growth trajectory, meaning they've gone down a little, they've gone up a little, but it's been kind of small movements in both directions. The Kindrel move, as I saw it, was all about accelerating growth. You have a company that wants to be looked at as a player in the most important secular trends, AI, cloud, 5G, you know, um, automation, attached to telco, financial services, um, blockchain, quantum computing, and you're growing one or 2% or going down one or 2%. I think Arvind identified that GTS, which is gonna become Kindrel, had become a bit of a boat anchor in terms of the company's growth. Um, being able to fully focus and lean in on the areas where they believe they're aligned, which I mentioned hybrid, automation, AI, um, making those the core, including with Red Hat, is going to give them a much more realistic trajectory to start hitting high single digit growth, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So with that in mind, I've gone a little long and thank you for letting me do that. Um, overall, a strong day, some good, good movement from the company, but proof will be in the pudding pat. Company's growth after Kindrel needs to be faster than it's been since. Well, the good news is, is that the I went too long. No, you didn't go too long. I mean, listen, it's Saturday. We're just we're chatting it up here. I mean, our, our favorite podcast goes an hour and a half. So <laughs> let's put that in perspective. So um, first off, expectations for tech companies vary widely, right? You have some of the tech stalwarts, uh, and then you have kind of mega growth companies. Uh, not necessarily based on what maybe these companies are, are doing quote unquote wrong when you're getting into, into single digit growth numbers, but it's the fact that they have monster businesses and uh, they're getting into the higher growth markets. They didn't start those highest growth markets, let's say like SaaS or, or the public cloud. So the commitment that, that our Arvin made was mid single digit revenue growth uh, uh, starting in, in, in FY22. That set the bounds. That doesn't mean they're, they're the company's not going to have 40, 50% growth businesses. They have that today in the hybrid cloud, uh, but it's just a smaller percentage as the overall and the Kindrel spin, uh, you know, I, I like, cause it, it, it is a drag that is a declining business as a sector in itself. And it's really focused on, on automation as opposed to what I would call innovation. Okay. I'm sure Kindrel and IBM uh, would argue that, but I'm just I'm just looking at the big picture, and it's not a criticization either. Uh, so you know, we're also looking. Uh, uh, he made the cash flow uh, statement, which is, hey, over three years, we're going to have 35 billion dollars in free free cash flow uh, at mid single digit revenue growth. That is the way you should be looking at us. Uh, half the revenue is uh, is software, and a third of that revenue is, is consulting and. I got a lot to talk about here, but I'm not because we were going super long. But net for me was the reinforcement that the hybrid cloud is going to determine the degree of success for IBM for the next 10 years. And the linchpin in that is absolutely going to be Red Hat. Okay. 
that might uh, be, uh, you know, low value conversation. But uh, and there's the dogs. I love it. Uh, we're doing this live, folks. Uh, but um, that is it. And will Red Hat, can they get some of the IBM loves to talk about the Fortune 50 and the Fortune 100? A lot of business there. But you know what, Daniel? There's a lot of business below the Fortune 100 that Red Hat uh, is huge in. And, you know, can they combat first? Can they combat um, VMware? in this space because essentially their value propositions are very similar uh, but most importantly can they combat the hybrid offerings of the native cloud players like aws uh, gcp and azure i'm going to leave it there folks you got a lot more to talk about it but we must go on in fact let's get into our next topic and that was micron data center of the future uh, I had the pleasure of hosting the Micron Data Center of the Future uh, event uh, for a press and an analyst and had a great conversation uh, with uh, their company's uh, head of memory and compute and their head uh, of storage. These guys are great. Uh, Jeremy Werner, he's the storage head, and Raj Hasra, uh, you might have um, uh, uh, remembered him from some compute jobs he's been in. Uh, in, um, but he's now the computer networking head for uh, Micron. And essentially what compute means uh, is memory. And we had this great discussion. Um, and I, I think where I was left with Daniel and I've, this whole notion of composable uh, memory, okay? Where, you know, today, if you, want, if you want more memory you in the data center, you probably have to buy a new compute node. But why, why don't we have to do that when it comes to storage? You can put a SAN, you can put a NAS, uh, you, you can make it composable. And that is, that is how uh, the big hyperscaler players have been architecting their data center. But this whole notion of the ability to, if you want more memory, uh, you have a rack of memory. Uh, imagine that, like having a rack of storage. So that is the future, and it's a standard called uh, CXL uh, that, that they're working on. It. And I, I have personally talked to architects at the largest hyperscalers and that is the next big thing uh micron is is leading the pack uh when it comes into that uh compared even to you know in in my opinion compared to samsung and and what hynix is doing out there uh and certainly uh micron is is uh, doing a lot of thought leadership uh, i was also uh, had the pleasure that same day that micron uh, came out with their uh, 7400 ssd line and essentially it's a DDR4, sorry, it's a um, full set of high performance SSD with, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different form factors that can hit uh, the edge of the data center, uh, high performance, mid-tier performance, uh, highest security, good security, all of these different flavors. And I was really left thinking um, it's great uh, that SSDs now have so much heterogeneity because, quite frankly, they were just one uh, one form factor uh, for everybody. And, and what that says to me is that SSDs are becoming even more important, which gets all the way back to, Daniel, a lot of what I've seen you talking about related to consumer behavior and this notion of, you know, I want it now, I want it fast, and I want it free, Okay. And then on the flip side, the, uh, the SSD folks are like, okay, well, how do I do that and uh, use less energy to protect the environment? So uh, I'm probably going to do a write-up on it. Uh, it, it was really uh, fascinating, but uh, I appreciated uh, uh, Micron uh, having me on. Yeah, it's, it's, it was great to see you there. Uh, Micron's been a, kind of a little bit of an uns unsung hero of, of the semiconductor space here. Uh, the company's performed very well. Storage uh, memory doesn't always get the same excitement that uh, compute does. It just is what it is. Um, but Micron's been extremely competitive. We've heard from the company. They've, they've been innovative. They, they're trying to knock down, um, you know, barriers to helping enterprises scale. You know, data center of the future. Look, if you don't have the memory and storage you need, all that compute is irrelevant. You need the data to serve the applications. This stuff works harmoniously here, Pat. And Micron is very, very much at the center of this. Um, you know, I'd say just to keep our show moving, um, 
this will be one to watch. It's a company to keep an eye on. I would hope that when you have a link to your piece for people that want to maybe read a little bit more in depth here, uh, you'll drop it out there for everybody. But uh, yeah, great day, great day for Micron, great event. And the host was pretty good as well. Um, I give him a seven. Uh, I appreciate that. Even though I had to wear a coat, uh, I didn't have to wear a coat. But, you know, when you see people show up with coats, you kind of got to put uh, uh, the coat on. Um, but, no, it's good. And, and I'd, love to, I'd love to have Mike around the 6.5 Summit uh, as well to uh, uh, talk to them. I've never seen more action uh, on, on the memory side. And, you know, Daniel, I, I kind of did my career as, you know, 10, 10, 10, I guess 10, 11, 10. But, you know, on the systems providers and then the chip uh, chip, chip, chip part. And then the analyst thing. And I even see, I even see Intel and, um, AMD talking about, uh, memory more and more. So, Hey, let's move forward. This is, this next one is kind of the dessert, uh, of the show. And, uh, this been a, a lot of fun. I mean, uh, you know, as you know, uh, Intel, uh, pretty much did a, uh, a, a public abandonment, uh, of Intel out there. Uh, to focus on their own M1 silicon. And uh, it's been nice to see uh, what I consider uh, truth telling uh, that Intel has been doing. And Intel came out with their second generation of um, their uh, positioning work, uh, which we're calling Intel dispelling the Apple spell. Yeah, and by the way, I'm still hung up on you wearing a coat. Um, I don't know about all that, but uh, I actually have to speak at a conference on Monday, and I'm gonna—I don't know what I'm gonna do. I'm so Wait, much. Daniel, who who are you speaking with again? Oh, yeah, it's pretty cool. So uh, thanks for letting me plug that, Pat. But uh, I'm speaking at the Channel Companies. You know, if you maybe know Sierra and their Best of Breed conference, talking about the shortage and what caused the semiconductor shortage, what's being done. And I'm um, I'm going to be speaking alongside uh, IBM CEO Arvind Krishna, Cisco CEO Chuck Robbins, HPE CEO Antonio Neri. Uh, I go first. I go first. So. <laughs> Um, I'm just warm. I'm the warm up act, but I'm very excited to be there. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun, uh, you know, even if it does mean traveling on a Sunday. Um, I don't know, Daniel. I've been to a lot of concerts when I was younger, and and sometimes the opening act is is the preferred act. So I'm yeah. expecting you to I'm expecting you to bring it. Mine, mine will be uh, mine will be a, we'll have fun, Pat. It'll be a lot of story we've told a few times about how we got into this mess, and sometimes I think about the world that everybody knows that what's going on with chips. But then I realized that we know this so well because we lived this every yeah. single day. Speaking of chips, all right, the final topic, the final topic. <laughs> okay, so Intel, uh, Pat, you know, a lot of people probably saw the Justin Long campaign, loved that campaign. Uh, received a little criticism for how much I love that campaign because, well, it doesn't really matter how good someone does a compete campaign with Apple. There's always gonna be people that are just gonna tell you it's, stupid because you know apple people are just you know they're, they're actually out right now trying to go buy an apple car anyway um but intel you know being more realistic is looking at that broader market and the opportunity and saying hey we do some things that are really innovative that apple still doesn't do now full disclaimer you and i were both super critics of m1 we thought it would take a long time apple did a little better than i thought in terms of getting m1 optimized but intel's still doing so many innovative things and their oems are able to really pivot off that whether that's dual dual screen whether that's you know your flexible notebooks detachables touch touch i mean my god apple get it together put a touch screen on your on your mac i know why you don't do it cuz you don't want to stop selling ipads but but for for crying out loud. So anyways, this was like a real people campaign. They were paid, um, but they had full option to opt in or opt out. And essentially this was done as kind of a, in, a, in, a, in a marketing traditional way where people were brought into a room, they were shown something with an unbranded standpoint and they were asked how excited they would be about it. They thought they were seeing features that were gonna come out in a new Apple. Turns out what they were really being shown is features that have been available in some cases for some time on Intel devices. and a lot of them just being blown away. Um, I thought it was pretty clever. I thought it was, you know, something that I think just needs to keep being hammered home. I think Apple fans will think it's dumb. They will always think it's dumb. So Intel cannot make a decision on how it markets based on how Apple fans are going to operate. Um, if I'm being critical in any way of the campaign, some of the features I think 
were hard to believe that not everybody already knew. But this also, Pat, is where I say I'm in a vacuum of being a guy that has 40 laptops in my office that gets to play with tons of technology all the time. And sometimes I forget that even people who are prosumers that really know tech may not be as connected to it as we are. But Pat, you know what? Look, Intel has been a company that's it, it, that has uh, had the benefit for a very long time of having very significant market share. Uh, at times that has kept them somewhat humble, maybe not being aggressive enough when companies like AMD and Apple have made moves that have been somewhat difficult on the company's longer term prospects. I like seeing Intel coming out with a little humor, a little, a little uh, aggressive posture. Like I said, I loved the Justin Long stuff because it was playful, it was fun. Yes, it picked at Apple, but but why not? That's not it's not uncommon. It wasn't wasn't ill or nefarious. It was just fun. And so this one was a little more technical. It was hitting the the the, the spots that that Intel knows it's got strength and its platform and its wide variety of product. But having said that, like I said, you know it's it's going to be met with mixed reviews. It was met with mixed reviews. The real question for Intel. Will they sell more client PC chips because of this campaign? That's what it's all about. We won't know for a few months, but the Apple spell, at least for a few people, may have been dispelled. And as we keep seeing it, people will realize the best innovation really isn't being done at Apple. Well, certainly, certainly not in uh, MacBooks, and I would even, I would even posit the iPhone. The watch is killer. You know, Will I get in trouble for saying that, by the way? The best innovation is me knowing at Apple? I don't Will think we not parse that out and quote it? I don't know. I mean, you and I uh, you and I showed up on uh, some people's hit lists uh, on our coverage on the M1. We even had I got the, uh, yeah, the Appalope or what was his name? The, uh, yeah, no, it was great. Listen, I, I'm just going to, I'm going to jump right in and, and I, I saw some of the criticisms, but you know, it's funny, Daniel, there's, there's only a few things good about being an, an OG. And that's, you've seen things behind, and you would like to think that it maybe gives you a little bit of perspective uh, as, as well. And being in the industry over 30 years, I've seen things like this go back and forth uh, so many times. You know, there were some people said, hey, I'm going to read this. All of it looks staged, and you will ask yourself why you're even watching it. So if you haven't done a primary research group, you need to shut the up. Um, I've done <laughs> probably 200 behind the glass, uh, research, uh, projects. And this is exactly uh, what they look like. Now, if Apple lovers went in expecting that it was Apple, there might be a little bit, Hey, I'm going to say that I love this stuff. Cause I, th I, I like, I love Apple. And I think this is Apple. I, I forget the name of the guy who was proctoring this. Was it chip or Nick? Um, but but definitely looked like uh, some of the people that, that I've met at Apple. So, you know, it, it was actually really good. So there is a little bit of that. And there is the disconnect between what people say they're going to do uh, in a primary uh, research session versus what they actually do. But all this stuff is completely missing the point. Uh, and then another person said, it's so insulting. Apple fans isn't exactly a bright move. So. Let me address the two of these very quickly. Listen, we're, we're way over. We're just riffing right now. It's Saturday morning. But, 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 but first of all, Intel is not targeting to educate the unmovable uh, Apple fans, probably like my wife, which is like she's got her MacBook. She knows how to use it. She's comfortable with it. And she's going to get just keep buying it and buying it, buying it because she doesn't have to relearn something and she likes how it integrates with her iPhone. That's it. She's not, she's never going to move. So, but she's not the target. Uh, what Intel is doing is, is they're, they're targeting people who are on the fence. Okay. Uh, uh, the, the on the fence voters. And the other thing they're doing is they are communicating that uh, uh, to their ecosystem software and hardware partners that we're very proud of what we do and we think we do a good job at it and and look at this so uh missing the point they're not targeting apple people completely missing the point point. and you know what if you haven't sat in a primary research market uh, uh sorry research study uh at you know 
10 p.m. eating M and M's, uh, uh, questioning people. You don't have any idea uh, what you're talking about. With that said, the fact is is that Windows PCs and the ecosystem has a much higher level of innovation that Apple has brought to the table since they brought the original MacBook Air. There's just nothing there. Why? Because the resources were not because Apple's not smart. They are. It's because the resources were put on iPhone, watch and iPad. That was the priority. And number four, maybe number five was MacBooks. And now services. Yeah. And, and they've cranked this up. I'm, I'm wondering maybe autos in there somewhere, <laughs> uh, but, but, but quite frankly, it just never was a priority. And if you remember, I call this the Tim Cook apology tour where Tim Cook went out and said, no, 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 PCs are actually important to us. You know, just, uh, uh, just wait. But um, I do give Apple credit for the M1. It is a high performance, um, low power uh, on the leading edge of, of manufacture. It doesn't run uh, many games at all that gamers uh, want to play. It's not fully compatible yet with some professional audio and video peripherals. And that's one of the biggest reasons that they're keeping Intel around. And also for the corporate users who have a, a nine month to a year uh, process uh, of, of testing. And, you know, when that security software doesn't work with the M1 processor, it becomes an issue. Okay. So give Apple credit uh, for innovation where it's due on the M1. But when it comes to the MacBook as a platform, not even close. I, 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 I've got nothing, I've got nothing, man. No, but that, you know, you, you hit it, you hit it home. Uh, some good silicon innovation, Pat, but not necessarily in terms of that whole user experience, certainly not at the enterprise level. Like you said, we're just kind of riffing at this point, but yeah. I give Intel credit. Like I said, you know, they stood back for a long time and let everybody kind of throw spears at them. And to some extent, they're standing strong, still a very significant market share, great partnerships in OEMs. You know what, if they want to take a little a little poke at Apple every every now and again, I, I think they deserve that. Yeah, it's exciting stuff. Pat Gelsinger recently came out and said, quote unquote, AMD's lead is over after Alder Lake and Sapphire Rapids. And it's like, wow. Uh, and I can tell you that Intel or Microsoft is not going to take uh, even the M1 uh, standing down. And let's put that in perspective. Apple has 8% market share. Now, most of that's in the premium market, you know, a thousand bucks and up. So it's very profitable. Uh, but kind of put in perspective of 8% market share as opposed to uh, iPhone global market share at around 25%. And US iPhone market share at 50%. So there's a big difference there. Daniel, I told you I was hopped up for this show and and we just let it rip. Uh, everybody who hung in there, thank you so much. We appreciate you. Uh, and we also love feedback. You know, tell us what we're doing right. You can send those to me. Send the stuff that you can't stand to uh, Daniel at, at Daniel Newman uh, UV. Uh, we love you. Uh, we care about you and really appreciate you hanging in there. So with that, Daniel, I'm taking us out of here. Have a great weekend, everybody.